All right, hello, Inside Voice community. I'm your host, Carrie Roberts. We're here today on the Inside Voice podcast, which is part of Voice. You can learn more about Voice at voicesummit.ai with all the events they have coming up, including Voice Global on June 9th. Today, I have a very special guest. His name is Steve Keller. He is the Sonic Strategy Director at Pandora. Thank you so much for being here, Steve. I appreciate it. No, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for asking me. Yeah, so I want to start um, with your background because I was telling you earlier when we connected, I personally have an interest in psychology and you studied psychology in school and you have this music background. Where did this love for psychology and music begin way back when? Yeah, I'll try and... Uh... <laughs> I'll try and keep my meandering story short. <laughs> I've lived long enough that there's a lot of dots to connect. But, you know, essentially, um, you know, the, the music piece um, has always been a part of my life for as long as I can remember. I, my, you know, my parents um, got to... Uh, an album, you know, because back in the day when I was growing up, you were listening to vinyl uh, for uh, the Disney Great Composer series. And I loved Beethoven. I wanted to be Beethoven, you know, wanted to be able to hear. But, I, you know, <laughs> Beethoven was was cool. So uh, I started taking piano lessons at an early age. Um, when I got into junior high, um, I had a cousin who played the guitar. I thought that was great. So I taught myself how to play the guitar, started writing songs in high school um, because it was a fairly effective dating tool. Um, but uh, I never thought about it as a career. Uh, so when the time came for me to start thinking about university, um, I'd always uh, been fascinated by human behavior, what makes people tick, um, you know, social psychology in particular and group dynamics. And so um, when I graduated from high school, I headed off to university to study psychology. Um, absolutely loved that discipline. Um, I graduated and the plan was then to go on to begin working on my master's uh, and a PhD. Um, and uh, so I was sitting out for a year preparing for grad school. I had a couple of jobs doing research and statistics for a community mental health organization and then teaching at a school for kids with severe behavioral disorders. Um, and uh, as I set out, I was playing music in coffee houses on the weekend because I'd never kind of moved away from music. I just, you know, it was more of a hobby. And I didn't have a, uh, a real aha moment. I think what ended up happening was I just gave myself permission to maybe do something different. Uh, so um, I started thinking about, well, maybe there was something to this music thing that I could make work. Uh, I went to some of my professors and mentors and got their opinion and their advice across the board was, hey, take another year off. You can always go to grad school, see what happens. And that's what I did. And the detour ultimately led me to Nashville. Um, and in Nashville, you know, I discovered that my real talent was uh, more in the area of, of production um, and um, composition. Uh, my, my big uh, break into the Nashville community was, believe it or not, doing dance remixes of country songs. Uh, for clubs. Do you have any of those? I feel like we need to hear uh, those at some I, point. <laughs> well, I've, yeah, I've, I've got a lot of them actually. Um, but, you know, I, I worked with a lot of artists like Tim McGraw and Winona, Leonard Skinner, Neil Diamond. Um, and uh, at the same time, you know, I was continuing to explore other things and I was doing music for commercials. Uh, and in that uh, exercise, I discovered that I really loved branding and advertising and marketing, not just music for commercials, but you know, the, the discipline of branding, if you will. Uh, and so um, I kind of launched my own independent consultancy for brands around that time. And then eventually in 2005, all of these somewhat diverse passions came together. Um, I was hearing, reading a lot about this thing called sonic branding. Most of the really interesting work was being done um, in Europe. Uh, and it was a combination of psychology, research, music, sound, entertainment, branding, marketing. Um, and I felt like this was, you know, where I needed to, to, to point my, my career path next. And so in 2005, um, I launched uh, IV um, and uh, that company um, eventually developed into um, uh, an audio consultancy um, where we made stuff for for brands, but more and more, uh, I found myself being drawn back into academia, leaning a lot 
uh, more on my training in psychology, having the opportunity to um, become friends uh, and research collaborators uh, with a lot of um, academic partners who helped you know, make me smarter, challenge me uh, along the way. Um, and uh, that kind of brings me up to the, to the present point where, uh, you know, a few years ago, um, I was drawn into Pandora's orbit, speaking at a conference. Um, we started doing some collaborating together. Uh, as I began to work on a sonic identity for uh, Pandora, it became really clear that um, there was a good synergy uh, between what I was doing and my talents and kind of where Pandora was and evolving. Uh, and so December of 2018, uh, we decided to put a ring on it. And um, I left uh, my company and um, start, started uh, working for Pandora as the Sonic Strategy Director, where essentially I get to do all the things that I've loved, um, but on steroids with a much larger megaphone. So um, that's uh, that's my journey, as short as I can. As yeah, I, can make I it for you know you. I I well I just love. Um, I think sometimes when we're young and you're coming out of high school or college, you think that you have to do one thing. Uh, but so many people I've talked to really combine all of their skills, and it's great to see that you've done that in a very creative way. And a lot of people know Pandora, you know, as um, kind of a music company and it provides great playlists and we can get music for free and download. Can you talk about the Pandora for brands and kind of what you do in that side of the business as well? Sure. Um, you know, as you said, a lot of people are familiar with the <clears throat> Pandora platform. I mean, I've been a fan of the platform uh, way back when it, when it first launched, when it was one of the first movers in the space, um, and still am. I think their music genome, uh, the way that uh, that's coupled with um, our AI to create, you know, recommendations works better than um, any uh any of them out there. And I don't just say that because I work at the company. Uh, so a lot of people are familiar with the product, um, but they're not so familiar with some of the other things that are going on in the background. So while Pandora is a, is a music company, it's also a, a data and science company. I mean, we have a, a staff of, of scientists. There are a lot of PhDs that work um, at the company, um, you know, a lot of technicians, uh, product specialists who are working on how to bring some of these, uh, you know, understandings about behavior, music, sound, choice, mood, emotion um, to bear on our discovery engine. Uh, but we also have a team of creators that are often working with advertisers to help create um, advertisements that might run on um, our platform. And so part of um, the impetus behind my hire was to uh, kind of help expand that a little bit. And so last summer, uh, we launched Studio Resonate which is Pandora's in-house um, audio first creative consultancy. Um, and we make stuff too. So, you know, we have producers, music composers, we work with voiceover talent um, to create spots. Um, but we've started to look beyond just our platform and how can we take our understanding about the, the science of sound, the psychology um, behind it, what we understand in terms of behavioral economics and consumer choices and kind of bring those together to become trusted advisors about all things audio for our clients. So a lot of my engagements um, aren't simply about, you know, how can you um, make uh, Pandora work harder for you uh, as an advertising platform, but really around, um, you know, in a broader sense, sonic strategy. How do we make um, sound choices, literally and figuratively, um, that really produce a return on investment for those, you know, sonic investments for our clients? Yeah, that's really exciting. I didn't know that Pandora did a lot of that as I was doing my research. So it's great to see that they're adding another piece to their company and you're leading a huge part of that. And I'd like to talk a little bit about um, kind of the mix of things you do. So from, if you can talk about it all, what happens to our brain when we hear sound? You know, when we're coming from a psychology standpoint and then also from a physiological standpoint, what happens to our body when we hear sound? Can you talk about that a little bit? 
Sure. Um, we can spend a whole day talking. I know. About uh, you <laughs> I know, watched but... your TED talk. I was watching a bunch of talks you did. I was like, we could be here well, all day. But I, yeah, I think it's important we talk about what it does to our the, brain and our body. The, well, the research is really vast. And as I said, um, I feel very fortunate to be um, part of a, of a group of academics, um, many who I've met and worked with, and, and quite a few who are just part of um, conversations versus LinkedIn, Twitter, some you know other off-platform uh, groups that I'm a part of, uh, and so uh, you know there there is a rich body of of literature around the way sound impacts our perception and our behavior. Um, so you know on the one hand. I, I talk about the way in which, you know, we're literally wired for sound, you know, the way our response times to sound um, uh, are much faster than our response types, uh, times to, to sight. Um, looking at the chemical components of what happens in our brain, um, the release of dopamine, which is a uh, a very addictive feel good drug that happens whenever we engage in behavior that's rewarding. Um, and music is a, is a powerful trigger um, for that. Uh, and why there's a lot of evoked, uh, evoke, evoked memories that are associated um, with sound for us. Um, there's oxytocin, um, which is a chemical that, you know, kind of helps us feel like we belong, maybe feeling a little bit uh, more trusting. Uh, and that happens um, uh, when we participate in listening and in, in, particularly in group settings uh, where we might move together. There's something we call entrainment and synchronicity. And some of the research has shown that, that um, individuals who engage in this kind of uh, movement uh, actually have more pro-social behaviors. Um, there's certainly cortisol that can happen when we hear sounds that um, make our pulse rise. You know, maybe the sound of an alarm or a piece of music that's loud and fast tempoed. Um, so these chemical cocktails are really powerful and there is a physiological um, response. Uh, we've looked at, at ways in which um, music and sound can increase or lower uh, your heart rate. Um, I published a, a paper um, last fall with Charles Spence, who's head of the Crossmodal Research Laboratory at Oxford, um, which was uh, you know, essentially a, a glorified literature review looking at the impact of music, uh, sound, and noise in uh, healthcare settings. Um, and not only on staff and physicians, but also on patient outcomes and patient satisfaction um, as well. Uh, so the, the more you understand the impact that's there, when you understand the power of sound to shape perception and behavior, um, then you can begin you know, strategically using these sonic building blocks, as I call them, um, or sonic seasonings, if you will, uh, to, to shape perception and behavior. Um, and that's certainly, you know, a, an interest of mine, particularly in the area of the relationship um, uh, uh, of how all our senses work together, um, which in psychology, the field psychophysics, and, you know, more pointedly, there's a, a a direction in psychophysics we call cross modalism, which kind of looks at how our sense modalities might naturally cross. So, can I change your perception of flavor by what I'm putting in your ears, not simply what I'm putting in your uh, mouth? Could I change um, your perception of a narrative or meaning of something that you see um, using sound semiotics or, or cues that we might pick up? Um, from sound that we're hearing that result in us seeing uh, or, or putting a meaning in, in an interpretation and in what we see. So uh, I think I'll stop there because otherwise I'll just keep talking about this. Yeah, I, you know, it's, so it's, much there. yeah, you had given um, the one you were talking about that you can change patient outcomes by sound. And you had given an example in a talk you did about, you know, the difference we normally hear kind of like the machines making sounds, which actually stress yeah. us out versus kind of this uh, one hospital, I guess I kind of this kind of yoga sound um, and that changed how people felt. How do you, in your role, in your job and working with companies, 
figure out the right sound for someone, not just in like the brand and how it sounds to them, but how it makes them feel and creates action for somebody to, to feel or do something about it. Sure. So, you know, I think when we talk about sound in an advertising context, um, I, I have, I, I very often will begin presentations um, to advertisers and brands um, with a series of observation. And the first observation is that sound moves us. You know, I just kind of gave you a, a, a high level of just a fraction of the research that's out there. But I wouldn't have to give you that research for you to actually believe that. You know it. You know, we can look back at our lives and see, you know, a piece of music that, um, you know, has stuck with us and brings back those memories of the first time we fell in love or a breakup or the way that we might use music to um, modulate our, our mood states uh, and our emotions. So that's a given. Everybody knows that. We use music and sound all the time in advertising because we understand it's a powerful tool to form an emotional connection. But the second observation is that for all that power, um, sound is really an undervalued asset. Mm -hmm. It's very often the last thing that anybody thinks about. You know, they've, they've scripted the concept, they've chosen the director, they've put the spot together. Oh, I've got a script. I guess I need somebody to read it. Or this would be more powerful with a piece of music underneath. So let me find something that I think works. So all these other decisions have been made before we even get to thinking about sound, let alone making decisions about it. And so there's this, I call it a value perception gap between our intellectual ascent to the power of sound, but then our behavior around it where we're spending much less time uh, let alone budget, um, let alone, um, you know, putting standards in place. If you think about brands and their visual identities, they have taken a lot of time and energy to develop style guides so that you know what the color of red is specifically, because it's not any color of red, it's a specific color of red, and what the type font is going to be, and, and the tone of voice, which in most style guides refers to copy. Um, and the tone of voice of the copy that you're writing. And these standards exist because we know the more consistent we can be, the more people will begin to recognize them. But we don't treat sound that way. It's kind of this thing that's, that's off over here somewhere. But what's changed, the third observation, is we've entered this era where um, we're, we're operating a lot more with, with our voices. Uh, and so, you know, you have smart speakers, you have connected homes, um, you have technology now where our interaction with a brand may not be through a visual, it might not be a print ad, it might not be a television commercial, it might not be a streaming video on the web. It could simply be through a smart speaker. And in that environment, how are brands going to stand out? How are they going to be differentiated? So the good news is that um, these, this new technology has brought these conversations around the power of sound and how brands should use them to the forefront. The bad news is that old habits die hard. And so when we start talking about sonic identity, we revert to talking immediately about the tactics or the asset oh, I need an audio logo, that thing like Intel has with the five notes, the bum, 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 or I need a brand theme, or maybe I need a jingle, or do I need a brand voice? Uh, and, and so we move directly to those tactics, and then we start making choices about sound the way we've always done, which is very often throwing things at the wall, you know, talking to, you know, a, a focus group or sitting around a table with creative directors and listening to things and coming up with a thumbs up or a thumbs down. So all of this is kind of to get you to answering the question that you ask about, so how do we do this? So we think about this more from the aspect of uh, design thinking than necessarily from music composition. So in that regard, 
where we start is we start with listening. We don't jump right in with what do we need to create? And that listening begins with a period of assessment where we look at brand collateral. We want to understand everything we can about the brand attributes, the, the values, the meaning, other identifiers that are, are, are used for the brand, what are distinctive assets that they have. Um, we do a series of interviews with stakeholders, with consumers, with, with people from the brand, with other people that might come into contact with the brand in a, in a sonic context. Um, and then we do a series of audits. How is the brand using sound now? How uh, has it used sound in the past? Um, what are competitors doing with sound? What's the spaces that they're playing in? Um, and then contextually, what's the sonic ecosystem? Um, what are all the touch points? You know, very often we think about commercials. Um, we forget about on hold. I can't tell you how many brands I know of that have actually done some work to develop an identity, but God forbid you ever need to call them on the phone. <laughs> You're taken to a completely different sonic universe. Um, so there's a, a myriad of touch points that brands don't often think about that are part of what will ultimately become a sonic identity system. So we start there before we e ever begin thinking about What's the sound of the brand? Once we have a good understanding of the brand, then we move into the design phase. And in the design phase, um, you know, there are a lot of, of companies who, you know, have different processes that they use. Um, we use a number of tools. And here, this really is a part of the, the science piece of it. We're looking at what are emotional targets? Are there certain emotions we want to evoke? Um, you know, what are the sonic building blocks that go to evoke those um, emotions, uh, you know, are there, there mood states that we're, we're going for? Um, what are those? We look at, at um, uh, you know, cross-modal factors. If, if there's a particular design aesthetic to the brand, if there are particular colors, um, how do those things inform our choices? Because we want sound to be congruent with all these other um, uh, sensory perception uh, elements uh, of the brand. Um, and then we, uh, we kind of lean into archetypes, which is another area that I've spent some time doing more empirical research in is this idea that, you know, there, there might be uh, audio archetypes, if you will, um, that communicate not just emotion, but meaning. Uh, brands are used to using archetypal language. They'll often think of themselves as, are they a hero brand, a jester brand, a sage? Um, so are there um, musical com components that uh, kind of bring that symbolism to the front and allow us to not just target emotions, um, but to target um, how they're used in a framework? You know, for instance, you, you read briefs all the time for music for advertising where they'll use words like um, happy or thoughtful or confident um, or trustworthy. And a word like happy in the context of a jester, um, we might think of that very differently than in the context of a rebel or a caregiver. And sonically, that may be translated in different ways. So, you know, we use this archetypal language as a way to, you know, help us move beyond just emotion and get into meaning. And so we, we, we develop an audio profile based on these techniques. We get together with the brand. We do a number of listening exercises um, where, you know, we expose them to different sounds and music. And together we develop a unified language for how we're going to think about describing the brand. And at that point, then we move into prototyping. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of work that's gone in before we even get to the point of composing the first note or working on the first piece of, of functional sound. And in that phase, we develop a number of prototypes. There's a number of iterations. There's a lot of back and forth. There's internal evaluations that go on. We kind of narrow the prototypes down to, you know, two or three based on the, the first assets that we're attempting to produce for the brand. And then we go into testing. Um, and I won't go too deeply into that, but we can, can um, test explicitly. Um, we can test implicitly. Uh, we can look at how well do these prototypes 
really hit our targets. Uh, and what I found is that the process itself works so well that um, I've never had an occasion where we've done testing and the results have come back. Um, oh, you totally missed the mark. Um, what we usually find is that one of the assets performs a little bit better than the other. Um, and so that gives us, uh, you, you know, a little bit more of an objective way of, of making decisions. And once we get through, through that and we've made our decisions, now we start looking at that auto, uh, that uh, audio ecosystem that we mapped out and where we're going to start implementing the brand. How do we need to shape the assets to work at those touch points? How do we build our sonic style guide that's going to inform the use of those uh, in the future? And what's the best way to implement those um, for a plan where we can attach KPIs to them, where we can measure outcomes, and we can really uh, optimize these sounds as we go along to get the maximum return on our sonic investments. So that's the, that's the process. Um, yeah, to get I, from point A to point B. It well, first of all, thank you for sharing that. And anyone listening, uh, go back and write, take some notes because <laughs> that was a really good breakdown. If any of you have questions live, you can ask as well. I think um, what I like you sharing about that so much is that I think a lot of times people think that those that are in the creative field that it's just easy. Like, can you just write me a song? Can't you just do this? And I love that you're breaking down that there is a process here, and there's research involved, and there's time. And it takes a while because you're trying to do it as a way to help a brand. Um, and you talk about in one of your discussions that you did for TEDx, you gave two examples, which were really great for ROI. And you had talked about kind of the behavioral piece of music. And you had given one about playing um, uh, French music in a wine store. Right. Um, and you had talked about that one. And then um, you had the banana story as well. So I'd love for you to share those two stories and talk sure. about the power of sound from a behavioral standpoint and an ROI standpoint. Yeah, sure. So the, the first um, piece of research that you mentioned is uh, actually kind of a, a classic example um, that's used a lot in these kind of discussions from a couple of uh, researchers, um, uh, North and Hargraves. And uh, they... Um, basically turned a uh, wine shop uh, into an experimental lab. Um, and uh, they had, uh, through the course of the experiment, um, uh, a, a place where there were um, French wines and, and German wines. Um, people would come into the store, they'd make their choices, they'd go through the checkout, and then a researcher would uh, begin to ask them a series of questions around their choices. Um, and what they found w in talking about, you know, what were affecting the choices was that, you know, most people would, would mention, uh, you know, maybe they were looking for a red or a white that evening. Maybe they liked the label. Uh, maybe they might have been familiar with the vineyard. Um, and uh, there were a series of, of uh, questions that talked about um, sounds in the environment and the music. You know, were they aware of music that they heard? Um, do you think that factored into the choice? And, you know, a small percentage were actually, you know, aware of music playing in the background. And an even smaller percentage said that it had any bearing on their choice. But what was interesting about this was that um, the only thing that they changed across those days in the experiment were, was a uh, music track playing. And on certain days, there was uh, French music that was playing. Uh, on other days, there was uh, you know, music that we might consider more, more German uh, in terms of the style and the genre and the instrumentations. And uh, what they found was that on the days that French music were, was playing, 77% of the wine sold were French. Um, and, you know, people might argue, well, you know, yeah, French, they're known for making wine. You would expect to sell um, significantly more bottles of French wine. But when you looked at the data on the days that the German music was playing, 72% um, of the wine sold were German. So simply by changing this music in the background, it was having an impact on um, the selection of the wine. So you think about that, you know, in the context of retail environments, you know, and that your choice of music isn't just background filler, 
but it may actually have an impact on decisions that are being made. Um, and, and this is particularly interesting for me. Again, you know, I mentioned earlier um, talking about gastrophysics uh, and, and looking at the, the psychology um, behind multisensory perception uh, and, and food. And in restaurants that play music in the backgrounds, uh, when you realize the power that's there, there's been research done that's shown, uh, particularly with the volume, you raise the volume in restaurants, um, it's, it's a problem. That's the number one complaint about restaurants is not the food, it's, it's the noise. But two things happen. One is loud volumes tend to dull our perception of flavor. And the other thing that happens is that we tend to consume more. So some restaurants might think, oh, let me make it louder. People are going to eat more. But the problem is you will probably not have a return customer. <laughs> but, you know, knowing those two things, we can think about that in a healthcare setting where maybe caloric intake is important. Are there sensory hacks, if you will, we can do sonically that might encourage people to eat more? Or if we could add sweetness to something sonically, um, as opposed to putting sugar into it. Maybe that might be better for somebody who's struggling with, with diabetes. So, you know, th these ways in which, um, you know, these, these cues and things that we hear um, affect us and affect our perception of the world and our decision-making process is very powerful. So that's the, the, the wine study that you mentioned. Um, the other piece that you mentioned was um, actually an, an experiential activation mm -hmm. um, at point of sale. And for those of you who might not, you know, be hip to the marketing tech technology <laughs> and, and, and uh, marketing lingo, um, as, as, as we are in, in my field, uh, point of sale is basically um, that place where you will actually buy something, purchase something. Uh, and so there was uh, in New Zealand, um, a banana brand uh, called um, all good. And uh, this brand was really positioned around um, fair trade. And the fact that, um, you know, the not only were the, the brands, the bananas a good product, but they made sure that they were kind of giving back to the growers, to the environment, all those things that we associate with fair trade. But they wanted a unique activation at point of sale that might help encourage people to buy fair trade bananas. So, they launched an activation in supermarkets, in the produce department, um, that uh, kind of made use of a visual cue um, and then a sound prompt. So the visual cue was a floor decal. We've all seen those. If you go to supermarkets or retail shops, sometimes you'll look down and there'll be an advertisement that you're walking over. Uh, it's just a way to kind of get the brand in, in front of you visually. So this campaign was called um, Listen to Your Conscience. So this decal had the all good um, fair trade moniker, the logo and the phrase, listen to your conscience, um, set right in front of where the fair trade bananas were located. The auditory hack was that they used um, specially designed speakers that focused the audio. So if you know anything about the physics of sound, sound is actually a, a wave, very much like light is a wave, it travels in waves. And um, a laser actually focuses those light rays into a, a pinpoint um, and that can, can use the power of that that light in different ways. Um, an acoustically focused speaker does the same thing with sound waves. It focuses those sound waves on a point to where if you're not standing into the area where the sound is focused, you don't hear it. And so they had one of these acoustical speakers placed in the ceiling directly above this floor decal. So when you stepped into the decal and you looked at the bananas, all of a sudden you heard a voice that seemed to be coming from inside your head. And it was saying, Psst, don't look around. Nobody else can hear me. I see you're looking at the bananas. Which one should you buy? Of course, you should buy the all good fair trade bananas. So it was this idea of, physically creating the voice of a conscience using an audio hack.
Um, and they, you know, they'd set up a hidden camera. It was kind of fun to see, you know, people <laughs> stepping reactions. into this, looking around, you know, where's this voice coming from? Stepping out, they couldn't hear the voice anymore, stepping back in. Um, and so it, it was very clever, but for the brand, it worked. You know, in the first few weeks of that promotion, the sales of all good fair trade bananas increased by 130% in the shops that were, were running this particular activation. So again, a very simple sensory hack, um, if you will, but it was using sound to draw attention to, the, to bananas, using technology to deliver the sound in a really interesting way. Um, and that message was clever enough and congruent, mind you, because the sound was used in such a way that it also matched the campaign, the idea of a conscience speaking to you, of having a conscience that would compel you to buy a banana that's fair trade and not just any other banana. And it was those combinations of things that really um, resulted in you know, this, this nudge towards um, consumption and purchase behavior that, that had those results. Yeah, and I think it's a good point when you're talking about sonic branding. It's not just about having it on a voice device. It is about, like you said, at a at an actual store, at a location, um, other things that you're interacting with. If you're presenting or you're a speaker, you know, you can utilize this everywhere. And I love that you're giving examples of ROI because again, we hear that all the time. Um, do you have any suggestions for people that want to create a sonic brand for voice? Um, you know, whether it's a big brand or a small brand, like anything they should be thinking of or a place to start when they do it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, going back to, you know, my, my longer explanation of, you know, the process that we engage in when we work with brands, you know, certainly any brand can take bits and pieces from that process and condense it. So if you're thinking about voice in particular, um, you know, Again, you need to start with your brand, understanding your brand and how does your brand sound? So, you know, the choices that you make about sound, um, let me give you six parameters that, that we think about. And this could be for, you know, selecting a voice for, uh, you know, a, a, a voice skill, if you will. It could be a brand voice for a commercial or it could be a piece of music. You know, the, the, the first parameter we looked at we look at is, um, is it congruent? Does it fit the brand? All the research shows us that that's extremely important. Um, the more congruent you make it, uh, the, the more it tends to be liked, the easier it is very often to um, remember. And our natural response to congruent things is a sense that, oh, there's something right about that. Now, I will give a caveat here because sometimes in advertising, we do use incongruence to capture people's attention, you know, something that you might not expect. So I think that can be a tactic. Uh, you know, this that was an example of, you know, the, the fair trade banana. Uh, while it was very congruent in terms of the brand, the activation was really incongruent. How often do you hear a voice in your head when you're shopping? I mean, some of us do, but that's a whole other discussion. Um, <laughs> So, you know, what we're, what we're really wanting to look at, though, is, you know, how do we have sound that's congruent with the brand? Because when we talk about sonic branding and identity, we're not talking about a campaign. We're talking about how are we creating and using sounds that are going to be used, you know, potentially for the life of the brand. Um, so they need to be congruent. To the point about using them for the life of the brand, the second parameter is they need to be flexible. So they need to be flexible enough so that you can adapt them to different contexts, different situations. Think of the McDonald's um, audio logo, the ba da ba 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 You know, I've traveled a lot around the world. I've heard it executed in a lot of different ways. But every time I hear those notes, I recognize it. It's flexible because the identity isn't built on a particular instrument. The identity is built on a motif. And we can interpret that motif in a lot of, of different ways. So, you know, with, with voice, very often there is a brand voice, but we might also want to think about how do we pair that with something else, you know, whether it be a, 
a functional sound, a notification or an alert, an audio logo, um, a snippet of a brand theme. There are different things that we want to think about um, so that we pair these associations so that at some point, if we need to maybe choose another voice, it may be a voice that's you know sonically within the profile, but it might be different enough that without another identifier, we might not immediately recognize it. So by building an identity system sonically, you know, we can mix and match these assets in a way that helps us be very flexible. So congruent, flexible, um, memorable, uh, you know, you need, need to be able to, to, to remember it. That's why a lot of audio logos are based on melodies. It's a lot easier to remember that than just um, particular sounds. So this idea of it being um, memorable um, kind of helps the, the distinctiveness, helps it to stand out um, from the crowd. Uh, we also want it to be appealing because we can have something that's congruent, distinct, flexible, but nobody likes it. So, you know, you need to take the time to make sure that your choices um, are appealing. Uh, and it also needs to be ownable. And by that, I literally mean the intellectual property. A lot of people don't understand that um, with audio assets that are created, there are very often um, not just trademarks that can be associated with sound, but even copyrights. Um, so you want to own those copyrights. Um, the idea of leasing a piece of music to build your audio identity around, um, you know, certainly there are exceptions to that rule that I can name, but for the most part, most brands that have tried to do that find at some point this property that they're essentially renting, the rent goes up and they can no longer live there. And they've spent years building equity in a piece that they don't own only to find that they have to abandon it and start all over again because they can no longer afford it. So, you know, so you need to, to, to own it at the beginning. So make choices and ask yourself as you're making them, is this sound congruent? Can I be flexible with it? Um, is it recognizable? Um, is it appealing? To what degree can I own it? Um, and those will will begin to shape the decisions. Um, and you know, we're talking a lot about science, and I want to be quick to say, you know, I, I refer to myself as an audio alchemist because this is it's it's a it's a blend of sound science and sound art. Uh, you know, and you talked about you know composers. What the research has often shown us is that you know composers, professionals who have done this for a long time they're making choices that seem to be instinctive. Um, you know, we really know from the science why they're making those, those choices, but they tend to, you know, very often land where we want them to land if we know how to communicate with them. So, you know, part of the reason for asking these questions and understanding the science is how we're going to build an appropriate brief for, you know, the, the talent, the creators, the individuals that are helping us you know, kind of bring the science, if you will, to life, you know, moving it from, you know, theory to performance art. Um, and that blend, when we get it right, true to the idea of alchemy, um, it seems like magic. Uh, it seems like somehow we've channeled a, a, a dark art somewhere that has helped us just land on the right thing. Um, but it's really this combination, this interplay of two sides of the coin of, of art and science. Yes, I agree. And it's it's interesting because um, I've been podcasting for a long time. And I would say in the last year or so, a lot more, a lot of people are podcasting, right? And you would have these companies that you could buy music, you know, that anyone could use. And what was happening was multiple podcasters were using the same sound. Um, and you could purchase it, but what you were saying was now all of a sudden, let's say we're both, uh, you know, coaches, for example, and we're both using the same sound. Well, now there's a problem because I can't differentiate between the brands. Um, so I love that you're bringing this to the idea because sometimes paying $5 for music that anyone can use could be a problem down the line too, right? Yeah. And I'm, I'm, you know, I need to also say, 
uh, you know, I'm, I'm full of, of caveats um, you know, <laughs> because, because as scientists, we're always doubters. Um, it's always about the questions, never about the answers usually. Um, that, uh, you know, I'm not saying don't license a piece of music. There are, are certain situations where, you know, again, if you've got a sonic um, style guide, uh, and you know, here's a palette. Uh, sometimes it might be more cost effective um, to use a, a piece of music that you've developed from a library. Or sometimes maybe there is some shared equity that you could benefit in certain situations from uh, using a track from an artist. But even then there's interesting things that you can do in terms of covers that might help you own it, maybe not in the sense of the copyright, but perhaps in the sense of a particular performance or a particular way that you hear it that you won't hear it anywhere else. Um, so I think, again, the, the key is to have an understanding of what your, your sound identity is and to realize that that's not necessarily about any one asset, though we might talk about distinctive assets like an Intel audio logo that you know over time has developed equity. And that's what we want to do with these assets. But you're looking at an entire system of sound. And so don't divorce the sound that's happening in your Alexa skill or your Google Play or your Apple HomePod with what you would hear on a television commercial or on an ad on Pandora or what someone hears on hold or what happens as part of the functional sound in an app, or what somebody hears in a retail environment, or what they hear at an experiential pop-up. You know, so now I'm just kind of running through potential touch points. Uh, and you know, the, the mantra, if you will, that to me is the key to um, sonic identity, um, because it's not just about assets, it's also about implementation, is that you want your assets to be used in such a way that your sonic identity becomes present as often as possible, as consistently as possible, in as, in as many contexts as possible. And when you accomplish that, that's when at scale, you begin to see these real benefits in terms of recall, brand linkage, um, willingness to pay, um, brand perception, you know, all of these um, benchmarks that as brands, you know, we're, we have KPIs associated with them. And you can do the same thing with, with sound. You know, what are your sonic KPIs? What are these sound choices supposed to, you know, bring to the table? And if you have those outcomes, then it forces you to start thinking about, okay, so how am I measuring it? Yeah, and, no, that's a really that has good an impact point. on choices. You know, another thing um, you had said in one of your talks was, and this is one of your big questions that I loved. You said, how can we use sound to elevate the experience of the world around us? And I'd love to know what that question means for you. Yeah, I mean, you know, we've we've been talking a lot about sound in the context of, of brands and branding. You know, and, and, and certainly that brings up questions around ethics mm -hmm. uh, as, as, you know, we think about advertising, which is essentially about persuasion. Um, and, you know, I, I would say that even art in a way is, is a form of, of manipulation. Um, it may not be as uh, conscious or, or evil as pushing a particular political viewpoint or using sonic propaganda, which by the way, that is a thing. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I'm talking about it in terms of uh, having, having a particular point of view that you're trying to get across. You're, you're trying to open someone's ears or, or eyes or senses to a perception of something in a new way. Um, you know, photography uh, is something that I've always loved. It was, I, I worked my way through college um, as a photographer. And the interesting thing to me as a photographer was going out and looking at what were quote unquote mundane, ordinary things that people walked by and saw every day. And simply by changing a perspective or framing something in a different way visually, it opened up a whole new world. It made something special that transcended, you know, the, the, the mundane part of it that, that we experienced all the time.
And so, you know, when we think about sound, sound has the power to transform things around us. You know, you look at this time of the coronavirus that we're in right now and how people are responding to that with sound, whether it be certain times in the evening where everyone will honk their horns or applaud, you know, as a way of conveying thanks to caregivers or people stepping out on a balcony when they're isolated from each other and begin singing a tune and they're joined by other people. And so I think about, you know, what are potential um, problems um, that we might face in terms of society or even the environment or certainly healthcare, where sound might be um, what I'd call a, a, a sonic intervention. Um, it's, it's a way to have an impact, maybe nudge our thinking, our perception, our behavior um, in a certain way that's, that's really beneficial. Um, you know, we talked about, uh, you mentioned earlier, um, alarms in hospitals. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of research around alarm fatigue that very mm -hmm. often there's so many alarms going off that even healthcare providers that are trained to recognize the alarms might miss one uh, because there's sound. Um, a friend of mine who's also an artist, Yoko Zen, um, uh, went through a period of um, health trouble in her life uh, where she was confined to the hospital for a while. And as an artist, as a musician, you can imagine with the cacophony of sound, how that might have affected her. And she came out of that experience um, with a renewed sense of, of purpose of going into healthcare environments, finding interesting ways to use sound as interventions for providers, um, for for patients, um, you know, one of the things that she did was a very simple intervention. She actually sampled the sounds that the alarms made. So she wasn't physically, you know, changing the contours of the sounds, if you will. But what she did was she changed the pitches slightly so that as the alarms began to function together, it didn't create a cacophony, but it created a harmony. And so that simple intervention created an environment that wasn't as, you know, creating such stress and trauma for patients that might be hearing it, but was also providing a way for the healthcare givers to still recognize the sounds. Um, so, you know, it's these kinds of interventions. Can we encourage people to, you know, to walk more. Is there a way we can encourage people to social distance? Or, uh, you know, I actually like to use the word physical distance more because yeah. I think, you know, social distancing is, is, is actually dangerous. So we're adapting to new ways to interact socially like we're doing now. Um, so, you know, can we, you know, can we use a sonic intervention uh, to, to, to help with distance, sonic interventions to um, help us throw away the trash or exercise more or give more to a particular cause. And I think this is where the science and the art can come together in really unique ways, where scientists and artists can combine their, their talents. Um, there's a neurogastronomy conference um, that uh, happens regularly at uh, the University of uh, Kentucky in, in Lexington. And uh, part of that conference um, is a competition at the end where they pair a couple of scientists with a chef to prepare a dish for a patient that's in chronic treatment, typically a, a cancer patient on chemotherapy, whose sensory perception has just been all out of whack. And you know, think about eating, the ritual of eating. Most of us never stop to think about how important it is in our daily life until you can't do it, until you can't smell any longer, or until something that you loved all of a sudden tastes foul. And how it changes not just your relationship with food, but your interactions with people around you. So the scientists and the chefs would work together to prepare dishes that 
these patients in chronic treatment would judge. And inevitably, it's a crying fest because everyone is so moved to hear these patients talk about the way in which somebody is actually listening to them, trying to help them with something that seems so simple in some ways, but that we never consider how deeply it can impact someone's life. And this is just you know, one of many examples of how these kinds of sonic inventions, I think, can be used to make the world a, a better place. Mm, that is, is beautifully said, and I love that you're talking always about the science and the art coming together. Um, I couldn't agree more. And again, for people that haven't seen your TEDx talk that you did in Nashville a few years ago, you give a lot of examples of this. Uh, the tree one uh, for one organization was beautifully done as well. Um, before we finish up, we do have um, one question for you. Uh, Steven asks, is it possible for independent music composers and producers to work with Pandora to create content for advertisers? Is that something that you all do or you work internally only? Well, we, we often, uh, we have an internal set of composers that we work with. Um, we also do work with um, external composers and music houses, depending on, um, you know, what, what the engagement is. So, you know, we're always happy to meet really interesting creative individuals. Um, and one thing that I will kind of add um, as, a, as a jumping off point to that question is, you know, if listening earlier to my life story tells you anything, it's, you know, the power of the pivot um, and the ways in which dots can connect and disconnect uh, creatively um, to, you know, push our imagination. And I think what's been interesting for me in doing this work is the ways in which, um, you know, there's, there's the obvious connection for composers and artists in terms of, you know, creating and producing assets. But very often we find that this approach to creativity and design actually stimulates creators in ways that they weren't expecting, you know, ways that impacts um, their artistic expression or opens up the door to another world or another vocation path that draws on their talents, but uses them in a in a different way. So, you know, I'm more than happy to have conversations um, with with anyone. So that's, if people, that's my life. Uh, I love it. Yes, I. you are just full of knowledge. Like I said, anyone that has been watching or re-listening to this later, go back and take notes. There is just some really good step-by-step -step nuggets that Steve has provided. Um, if people want to connect with you, if they have questions, or if they're a brand that's interested in working with Pandora to have their Sonic brand on, how can they do those things? Uh, sure. I think the, you know, the easiest thing would be to, um, to reach out to me um, at Pandora. It's S. Keller 1. Um, not sure who the first S. Keller was, but I'm <laughs> S. Keller 1 um, at Pandora.com. So you can just reach out to me uh, that way or go visit, um, you know, PandoraForBrands.com or StudioResonate.com. Uh, there's a lot of information there around music, sound, strategy. So particularly if you're an advertiser um, or in branding and marketing uh, or have an interest there, um, there are a lot of things from insights, blog posts, research, connections that I think you'd find fascinating. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Steve, for again, bringing not only your insight, but your passion for what you do. We greatly appreciate it. And I look forward to hearing more of all the things that you and Pandora are going to be doing in the future. Well, thanks so much for the conversation. It was great to be here. And hopefully everybody listening will um, go out or stay in and listen to the world in a little different way today.